Aloha and welcome to Cooper Union, what's happening with human rights around the world. Today, we'll be looking at the 20th anniversary of the UN World Conference Against Racism, Racial Discrimination, Xenophobia, and Related Intolerance. Today, although it's very important, today is the International Day for People of African Descent. We're actually celebrating that for the first time ever. And through this observation, the UN's aiming to promote the extraordinary contributions of the African diaspora around the world and to eliminate all forms of discrimination against people of African descent. Last week, of course, you'll remember, we had two fellows that are participating in the International Decade for People of African Descent that were in Geneva and participating remotely. But today we're looking at the UN World Conference Against Racism, known as the Durban Declaration and Program of Action. And I'm so honored to welcome Kenneth Deere. Kenneth Deere was a participant. He participated in regional meetings leading up to it. And we're going to reflect today on what that Durban Declaration of Program of Action means two decades later. Kenneth, thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thank you for inviting me, Josh. It's an honor for me to be here. Kenneth, I remember, why did you think it was so important to make sure that you attended the Durban Declaration <coughs> Program of Action? Well, it, it's, uh, you know, racism, indigenous people are, you know, are victims of, of, of racism, just like, you know, uh, people of African descent, just like uh, 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 people, uh, Jewish people, uh, uh, Armenians, you know, there are uh, uh, indigenous people have been uh, uh, victims for, you know, for centuries uh, following, uh, you know, particularly uh, European contact. You know, we, we've been, uh, you know, racism is uh, based on the concept of, of uh, racial superiority and that uh, some people feel they're, they're, they're superior to others, so what their race is superior to another race. And uh, when we got in contact with the Europeans, you know, that has been one of the fu fundamental uh, issues uh, uh, between Europeans and indigenous because they didn't consider us, you know, equal. And also the, uh, the whole uh, doctrine of discovery is, is, is uh, also based on that. And the, when the popes d decided that uh, if we weren't Christian, uh, then we, uh, uh, we didn't have any, any right to own the land and we had no more rights than the animals in, in the lands that, that, that they discovered. So those are the fundamental basis of the uh, of racism against indigenous people. So it really, really was important that indigenous people have a voice and, and not be forgotten in this uh, in 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 the uh, in the world conference in Durban, South Africa. And it, the Durban conference, I remember, it started on thirty first of August. Many people arriving, and then it went all the way through seven of September, just right before nine eleven. Could you walk us through maybe? what it takes to participate in a world conference against racism and how that negotiation process happens. And if you want to share about the North America prior, I know there's a lot of regional mechanisms and it was that decade, right? Where there was the world conference on human rights as well. That was quite significant. Yeah, we were in the era, the hot era, I think the height of, of the world conferences, you know, the, you know, the, the earth summit, I think was in 92 and 93 was the uh, human rights one in, in Vienna. Uh, there might have been others before that, but then you had the racism in 2001 and sustainable development in 2002. And the world conferences were, were big at that, at that time. And, uh, you know, when, when you have a, a United Nations World Conference, it, 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 because it has to have a bringing together the whole world, there's a whole lot of peripheral meetings that happened before uh, you, you go to the World Conference. And, and uh, so you, uh, our region, you know, it, uh, that North America is, is part of is called WEOG. Western uh, Europe and other governments. So I've taken all the states in Western Europe and the other governments are Canada, United States, Australia, and New Zealand. So, so this region like wraps around the, halfway around the world. And so, uh, um, and a world conference works is that you have five regional conferences in each of the five regions and, and the outcome documents from those, uh, 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 from those regional meetings, uh, you know, uh, contribute to the uh, outcome document of the world conference. And uh, as you, we all know, a world conference um, um, is, uh, is not about uh, the bells and whistles. It's not about the, the, the movie festivals and, the, and the, um, all the other activities, cultural activities and the singing and dancing. A world conference, the real uh, part, issue of the world conference is the outcome document. What comes out, the official UN document that comes out of a world conference. And that's the, uh, the key. All the other stuff is uh, window dressing. And uh, so we, we have to, uh, we have to focus uh, not on the window dressing, we have to focus on, on the content of the outcome document. 
And there's a huge document, a Durban Declaration, it's like a small book. And uh, so there's a lot of material uh, in, that, uh, in, in that document. So indigenous people had to participate uh, in, in, the, in the regional uh, meetings in each of those uh, five uh, regions, you know, in, in Latin America, then in Africa, Asia, you know, uh, uh, Eastern Europe. So uh, as much as possible, indigenous people had uh, tried try to participate. In some regions, of course, we're more successful than, than, than in others. But, uh, but we, we did have a pretty good voice. I think we had a strong voice. There were a lot of indigenous people uh, who took part in those uh, uh, meetings and regional, regional meetings. And then when the World Conference itself came up, there was, there was a, lot, a, lot of, 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 a lot of indigenous people. And it's important uh, to be there. You gotta be visible. If you're not visible, states uh, won't um, uh, you know, forget about you, ignore you, and, and, and you'll end up you know, in, a, in an unhappy situation with the, with the outcome document. Uh, personally, I was there as a journalist. I, 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 the uh, Office of the, of the High Commissioner of Human Rights in, in, in Geneva invited, I think there were seven indigenous journalists. I think there were eight. I can't remember the number. And I was one of them. So I had a, I had a, vet, a, a press badge. So I was fortunate. I, I could be uh, in, in the meetings and also I, I could be in, in, in the, uh, the, the press, a huge uh, press center, media center. You know, and so I was able to take advantage of that, and and uh, you know, uh, you, you know, the, the the United Nations is very very careful. They don't like activists posing as journalists, and uh, I shudder that I would do that. And um, so uh, you know, so but I, I was there as as a journalist, and uh, we were able to use our um, our media access to uh, to get into places that uh, some. Uh, that representatives can't get into, and vice versa. There were some places as a journalist we, we weren't allowed allowed to go uh, to go either. You know, so it's a little bit little bit of give and take. But it's important in in us that, that we had a journalist there to record uh, what what happened, and uh, and also to influence other media uh, to make sure that other media are aware of the indigenous presence in in, in Durban. No, really, when we look at the Durban Declaration, and although the standard of non-discrimination has been established as a bedrock principle of international law, a persistence of racism and racial discrimination, xenophobia and related targets, clearly demonstrates the need for new ways to address the problem with more resolve, more humanity, greater efficiency. And we could see that when we're there. I mean, you sharing the going back and forth, it makes me think there was also the civil society report that was being written on top of the official one. And at that point, the High Commissioner for Human Rights was Mary Robinson. And I also remember the, the idea of bracketing text. Can you maybe share some of those stories and those aspects of what was going on at, in Durban? And of course, it'd be the whole city, right? So you'd have to go to the official space and then community centers and, and all around. Yeah, the, the, uh, the World Conference was huge. It, it was over, you know, a, a lot of space. You know, there was a, a not only was there a conference center where the where the politicians were, but there was also the stadium. Uh, there was a, a you know, and the, the whole issue. The, the, I think, uh, if I remember correctly, civil society was still a, a young term at that time in Durban. You know, it was a new concept. Before it was uh, it was NGOs, all right, non, non governmental organizations, so, and they uh, and they want to have a, a nicer word, <laughs> so they use civil society uh, and and probably broadened. Uh, you know, you didn't have to necessarily be a, a registered NGO with the UN to participate. You know? So civil society uh, opened the door a little bit wider to to, to non-state actors in, in, in the uh, in the process. So and also the the uh, and, and they wanted to have their own declaration. They uh, you know civil society felt uh, states were not listening to them uh, entirely, and and they they wanted to uh, have a, a better influence on, on what, what was happening. And so the civil society was was coming up with its own statements. So they were frustrated with the with the state process. So they were coming up with their with their own statement. And, and this was a stronger, probably a stronger statement than, than, than the states eventually agreed to. But that's important. Uh, the role of uh, of non states to put pressure on on states is a very very important role, uh, because if you leave states alone, you, you they're going to go in their own way. And uh, and uh, you know, if you ever listen to a, a report of a, of a state about racism in their country, they will tell you, well, there's no racism, <laughs> very little racism. And uh, what we know is different. You know, we know there's a lot of racism. And uh, so that's why uh, non-state actors have to be involved to keep the states honest or as honest as possible. When you remember the negotiations, uh, I remember also 
were there highlight speeches that you remember? I remember seeing uh, Castro giving a speech that went on for hours, <laughs> just off the top of his head about the history of racism, actually connecting even with Taino and the European explorers first arriving. You touched upon that with the doctrine of discovery. Um, and in 2001, there still wasn't the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which came later. Could you see how the World Conference of Racism was an important stepping stone to establish the recognition and move towards the reality of the rights of Indigenous peoples? Absolutely. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, there in other uh, um, uh, situations in, in the UN, you know, the UN was really, really struggling with the, with the, the term indigenous peoples. They, that's why, you know, you had the working group on indigenous populations. You know, uh, you, know you had the, uh, the, uh, the uh, international year, but the world's indigenous people, but no S, and then the decade of the world's indigenous people. So you, you, uh, you know, they, the, the states were really reluctant to use the term peoples with an S, um, because they uh, it implied rights under international law, and, and the states were resisting that. And so the uh, indigenous people, you know, at that time in, in 2001, we were in the middle of negotiations of, of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, you know. And, uh, and so the, uh, the, the declaration, I mean, the World Conference was an opportunity to highlight the racism that indigenous people felt. And so we have fought hard very, very hard to get the term indigenous peoples used in the declaration. And it does, it's there. It was, um, uh, uh, unfortunately, well, first of all, let's talk about the good stuff that, that you know, they, they uh, you know, they recognized that, it, that indigenous people were, were, uh, were victims of racism and racial superiority, discrimination, and, uh, and, and that uh, some of it was violent and, and some of it uh, was, uh, you know, subtle. It's, uh, you know, it, 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 this, that racism dispossessed uh, and people on their lands and their, and, and their language, you know, and their, their culture. There was a, a, a awful lot of uh, uh, recognition of, of the suffering of indigenous people because of racism. So, and uh, so there was a lot of, um, you know, re uh, uh, references to indigenous people in, 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 the, in the declaration. That's the good part, all right? However, uh, and, and people would say, well, wow, it's the first declaration using the term indigenous peoples. From that you went and produced. However, paragraph 24 in, 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 in that declaration states that the term indigenous peoples in this declaration does not imply uh, uh, rights under international law. And that was a racist and discriminatory paragraph in a document that was against racism and discrimination. And it was embarrassing. You know, it was embarrassing for states to do that. But uh, you know what, what they are telling us is that if you wanted the term indigenous peoples in the text of the, of the declaration, there was uh, there was so much resistance to that that they had to put states had to agree to put paragraph twenty four in so so sort of indigenous peoples can stay in the text. And I, I I thought that was a weak argument, but anyway, that's that's what that's what happened. Uh, states were telling us that it was a tough negotiation. Uh, by states who are uh, still would not recognize indigenous peoples as peoples, and their, their rationale was, they were saying that the that indigenous peoples, uh, uh, as, as uh, being, uh, I guess, uh, subject of inter international law, was unsettled law. That was the term they used. It was unsettled law. This was two thousand and one. This is the twenty first century. You know, and and states were still, you know. Squabbling, squabbling about indigenous people being equal uh, to, to all other peoples. It's amazing. It, 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 that's the resistance that indigenous people are facing. I think you can't, uh, you, you know, it's such a, a capsule, you know, of, of, of racism that indigenous people thought. I, I, it, it gets me so angry. I really get mad at, at paragraph 24 and, and all that it means and, and, and all, that it, uh, all that it stood for at, at, at that time. And, uh, and even though there are a lot of good stuff in, in, in the declaration, fighting uh, discrimination and racism against indigenous peoples, paragraph 24 sort of undermined all of that in, in my mind. You know, it, it weakened it and uh, it, 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 um, you know, it, it just showed how callous and, and, and what states can be. And I think it's really gets to the essence of what you're describing of just equality, of equity, of recognizing the historical harms and then guaranteeing dignity for all future generations. And 
some of the language that you described is good, like paragraph 39, recognizing indigenous peoples being victims of discrimination for centuries and affirming that they're free and equal in dignity and rights. I mean, basic things in the UDHR, recognizing the value and diversity. What I thought was good though was they, part, they at least started to see that they discussed the aspect on the understanding of the connection with the environment. And of course, as we see the world we find today with world on fire and multiple continents and tropical storms and hurricanes, devastating communities, finally that understanding that indigenous peoples always knew, and maybe you could share that from the Haudenosaunee perspective, there are certain aspects. Haudenosaunee, of course, contribution to the principles of democracy with Ben Franklin studying that, but also even that larger image of working and living as one with the world and the natural environment. One of the, when, when the indigenous people went to the United Nations in 1977 and that famous uh, uh, meeting on the NGO conference on, on, about racism against indigenous people in the Western Hemisphere, uh, the, one of the speeches that the, that the Haudenosaunee made was that uh, uh, to the United Nations was that who is speaking for the animals? You know, who is speaking for the birds? Who is speaking for the fish? Who is speaking for the trees and the plants? You know, right? And uh, all those things that, that are coming to natural, natural world. Who is speaking for the natural world? And that's what indigenous people were bringing to the UN, the voice of the natural world, because we are so close to the natural world and states are so far away from the natural world. And, and that's what, what we, were, we, were, we were bringing to. And, uh, and, and, I, I, and you know, we, we, we've probably been talking about environment and climate change longer than anybody. You know, because um, we could see the, the, the destruction of, of, of Mother Earth uh, happening uh, before us. And we had a greater understanding uh, of the damage that, 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 that was happening. So we were trying to contribute that through, uh, it, through the world's, uh, the Earth Summit, you know, in, uh, in, in Brazil and, and, and other places. And later on in the, uh, uh, the following year of the following Durban meeting uh, uh, in Johannesburg, you know, at, at sustainable development, we were giving that same, those messages then and we're still, Giving it today. Today we're still giving those uh, uh, those kind of speeches, and except now we're saying that, hey, you see, we were right. <laughs> we were right all along, and you wouldn't listen. And now, now they're starting to listen. So now we, indigenous people, have a, a having a greater say in the climate change uh, 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 discussions that we didn't have before. You know, the, you know, the Paris Accord gave us a small little voice, and and we're we're, we're making that voice as, as bigger and bigger as much as we can. Uh, that a greater say in, 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 in mitigating uh, 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 climate change. So there's a lot. Racism and discrimination against indigenous peoples has set the world back. It, 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 it has, uh, you know, the world would have been better off if, they had, if, if the world had contributed indigenous peoples equally and respected our, our, our teachings, our, our philosophy, our science. And uh, I, I think we, we, the, the world would be, would be better off. And so we have to make up for that lost time. And we have to uh, you know, get in there again, keep banging on the door, you know, getting our foot in the door and getting inside and doing the best we can because it's not just the non-Indigenous people who are suffering. You know? it's our, we're suffering from climate change as well and the changing world. And, uh, and we've got to end racism. One of the things I, I want to say to you, you know, you, as, uh, I'm, I'm sure the next question is going to be, do you think the Durban Declaration had an impact? I, I don't know. I, I think that it did a lot of good things, but also I think there's a rise in racism today. You can see it. You can see it in the streets in some of the most developed countries in the world, you know, that, that there's been a rise in, in, in racism. And why is that? You know? and, I, and I think, you know, there's a, there's a scramble out there about, you know, I think indirectly it's climate change because society is changing. And, and they're struggling with that change and, and, uh, and, and they're lashing out at minorities you know, and people who look different than, 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 than they do. And uh, so I think race, uh, the German Declaration has to be read and the plan of action has to be read in today's um, uh, situation and has to be improved and changed and uh, interpreted in a, in a better way to, to try to uh, uh, combat uh, racism because, because racism is on the rise. And, uh, and we're gonna lose. We're gonna lose ground if, if, if the world doesn't smarten up. Oh, it's so true. And you brought up some. Of, I mean, it is loss. It's it's not understanding the interconnectedness. And in paragraph forty three, they did say we recognize a special relationship indigenous peoples 
have with the land as the basis for their spiritual, physical, and cultural existence, and encourage states wherever possible to ensure retaining ownership of the land. That's so essential because all the biodiversity is always on the land that's in indigenous people's hands. And that's essential as, of course, we're getting to the anniversary of that Stockholm summit where indigenous peoples, the Sami met with First Nations, then that far where people realize that common positions. But the other point that really gets me thinking as you pointed it out, it's, it's that point of will the world listen? And I think there has been some gains in the sense of, there also is mention of welcoming the decision to create the permit forum, which just celebrated its 20th year. So it's creating that institution. And then I know next month is the session of the UN Human Rights Council. And that's important because the UN Special Rapporteur on the Situation of Human Rights and Fundamental Freedoms of Indigenous Peoples will mandate will be reviewed. Why is it also important to continue this work from Durban every September when the UN Human Rights Council looks at those resolutions related to Indigenous Peoples and, and how do people get involved? I, I remember Durban now as you talk about it like it was just yesterday. We're running around with the samosas getting a snack because there's never enough time with the Superman S shirts to get indigenous peoples written. How's that different when you go to Geneva annually to be able to get those strong resolutions to make sure that, like you said, we don't go backward, but we build better. And I love, of course, how you used that Haudenosaunee seven generations to anticipate the next question. <laughs> right. uh, the, today, like uh, the Human Rights Council, of course, is responsible for the uh, implementation of the Durban Declaration. And uh, they have a separate meeting uh, on that. And I, I don't know when declaration is, I think it's in June. But uh, today, uh, the Human Rights Council in, in coming up in, in, in September, uh, we, we have uh, two sessions on, on the uh, issue people. One is the report of the Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous People. It has a, he has a shorter title these days than the one that was in uh, the Durban Declaration. And, uh, and then we have, to have the EMRIC, we have a report of the EMRIC and we have a panel and the panel discussion will be will be about COVID again, um, but the most uh, and, and those are important things to to, to attend and, and uh, uh, important for indigenous people to participate in. Uh, of course, we don't know if, if the meeting is going to be open. We hope we'll find out tomorrow. Um, and but if you can't get there, you you can put in put in written written uh, uh, submissions, and, uh, and and you might be able to get a chance to speak. But um, uh, the most important part of, of that, like the outcome document of, of the World Conference, the Durban Declaration, the, the resolutions that come out of the Human Rights Council are important. And uh, and uh, when, I, when I go to the, uh, and some of people like other people as well, myself and others, we go early to the Human Rights Council to, to sit in on the negotiations on the resolution on Indigenous rights. And that's important uh, to be there to influence the actual text. And, and it's also an opportunity because uh, uh, in, we are we are allowed into the negotiation with the states. You know the the, the the resolution is chaired by Mexico and uh, Guatemala, and indigenous representatives are allowed in the room, and we can speak. You know we can speak in the, in there, and and we do, and we have to, and and it's also it's it, being present uh, also influences states, and our our friends feel our friendly states, quote unquote, that in quotes, uh, feel more emboldened when we're there because, you know, to support them. And the negative states feel a bit more uncomfortable, you know, because we're sitting there. And if they want to say something that undermines our, our rights or, or what we're asking for, it makes it a bit harder for them to do that. So it's important for us to, to, to be there, to, to be in, in the uh, negotiations and, and also to lobby states, you know, to talk to states. And I encourage people when they ever do to, to, to go to a UN meeting, you know, you, you find you can go to the meeting, you can, you can you sit there, you can you can make a big speech, but it's also an opportunity to speak at states at a, at a high level, you know, to speak to ambassadors or, or the permanent the representative uh, at some level, you can get better access to the states at the UN than you can at, at domestically. And, and it's uh, good for states who, in addition people who have a hard time speaking, speaking to the state at home, you do it at the UN, you know, and you can open doors. You can you can speak with them at the end, all of a sudden at the UN. The next thing you know, at, at, you're talking to them at home about those issues. So there, it's the United Nations offers opportunities, not and not, it's not a big room. You know, it's what happens in the hallway, the coffee shops. You know, 
know, in the streets. <laughs> you know, it's uh, it, 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 there's a, all kinds of uh, opportunities, and you just have to know how to push the buttons and pull the levers to get the best out of it. Oh, that's really good points, and we appreciate those ABCs of advocacy. Uh, and that's really what we have to look at. And those world conferences were very large, and we're commemorating 20 years ago. But it's those meetings every year that really also make the changes that you're organizing around. And when you look at the World Conference Against Racism and you look at these decades, I think one of the important points that also comes about, you get me thinking about what comes up next. And one of the exciting things that's gonna be tabled according to a meeting that just happened today in Geneva will be the right to a clean and healthy environment that's building on another rapporteur's very important work. But the other one is supposedly a special rapporteur on climate change and human rights, which indigenous peoples have been lobbying for. Can you maybe share how these two developments next month at the Human Rights Council's 48th session would be a powerful addition? I think it would be. I, I think anything, these special rapporteurs have a very specific job and, and, and they, they are effective. I mean, a, a good rapporteur can be very effective. And uh, in, in shining light on, onto the issues uh, like the rights of indigenous peoples, you know, like environment, you know, like uh, women's rights, uh, they, they all have uh, very important roles. And, and now one on, um, on human rights and environment is, is, a, is really important because it's, you know, uh, some states and some, uh, what do you call those things, environmental organizations or uh, conservative organizations, are uh, you know are trying to put these lands aside so that they don't get uh, uh, to, to protect the air or whatever like that? But then they want to throw the indigenous people out of those lands, you know? and so they, the human rights of indigenous people have to have to be protected in, in those cases. You know, or again, we're going to be double victims. We're going to be victims of climate change, and we're going to be victims of the mitigation of climate change. And uh, and so that's why we have to be there. We have to be, be, be present, and and we have to convince these special rapporteurs to protect uh, uh, indigenous peoples and. And a, a special rapporteur on human rights and, and, and climate changes or environment, what I can't remember the title exactly, um, is important because we need that. We need that uh, people to shine the light on, on our situation. No, oh, that's, that's excellent. And of course, when we go back and we remember those nine days of negotiations, we also know then a couple of days later began 9 11. And we know today, of course, Biden said he was ending the forever war. But Kenneth, as you remind us, really, the forever war has been with indigenous peoples and not recognizing the inherent dignity of arriving here 500 years ago and not understanding the wisdom and continuously ignoring that knowledge that actually is essential for the survival of all humanity. So that's probably the message that has to be heard and must be heard as we move forward. I just wonder, Ken, they're, they're saying that uh, you know, the, the US just ended its longest war, has it? I think the longest war America has is against indigenous peoples. And is it is it is it over? Uh, you know, there are, are, are there peace treaties with all of the indigenous people, and all and those treaties have they been honored? You know, uh, you know, I, I I think the war against indigenous people is still there, a, a low intensity war uh, against indigenous peoples and the continuing occupation of their lands, ignoring of of, of those treaties uh, that that have international st stature. You know. The, Treaties with uh, between indigenous peoples and, and states are the same as as any treaty anywhere else in the world, and and, uh, and so if, you know, the United States has to start recognizing that those uh, violations that they have of international law in, in terms of of, of people's in, uh, in, in, you know rights, and also uh, what other is there is there peace between indigenous people in the United States and. Is there an ongoing war, a low intensity war against indigenous people? I think the, the war in Afghanistan was not the longest war. Yeah, and um, and uh, I think the war is still continuing with indigenous people. Thank you, Kenneth. I, I agree. And that's why you see NGOs still organizing. We can see the US Human Rights Network is usually very active in the UN, will be hosting its next event starting tomorrow to then look at this important work. and. They're also commemorating one of the successes was creating that new actions around the murder of George Floyd to create a commission of inquiry to get the UN Human Rights Council to actually take action. And we'll see what happens next. 
with the national gathering that will take place starting tomorrow. But we thank you, Kenneth, for coming and sharing with us uh, a walk down that road of Durban and all that was able to be accomplished. Yeah, there are so many more stories too, but uh, for some other another time. That sounds good. Let's just do that for the next time we meet. But thank you so much for joining us today and look forward to future meetings, hopefully in Geneva in person. Right, thank you.